Of all angels, Lucifer was the most magnificent God had created. Aware of his beauty, brilliance and many qualities, Lucifer felt elevated above the other angels and, at some point, even above God. He wanted to be like God, so he created a throne for himself above the stars and convinced a third of the angelic beings to join his side and take over heaven. But Lucifer lost the war and was banished from heaven, cast down to hell. God transformed Lucifer's beauty, the trait he admired most about himself, into ugliness. And thus, the once so handsome angel became the vile, wrathful creature we know as Satan. Lucifer had fallen for the worst of sins, pride, which led to his inflated sense of self-importance, power and entitlement. In the 13th century, theologian Thomas Aquinas elaborated on what he called the capital sins in his Summa Theologiae, in which he considered the sin of pride the worst of all sins. Through pride, one becomes susceptible to the other six sins. Pride, therefore, is the instigator, the gateway drug to evil. However, nowadays, many people seem to encourage pride. We celebrate those boasting of their accomplishments. And social media is full of individuals who continuously post about their extraordinary lives. And we're not just proud of our achievements. We're also proud of where we're from, what nationality is in our passport, how we look, what skin color, and even what gender we have. But how and why is such pride bad exactly? Aren't there good forms of pride then? The seven deadly sins is a Christian concept that presents humanity with seven immoral acts, seven transgressions against the divine, oneself and the world around us. The idea of the seven deadly sins came to fruition when the desert father Evagrius Ponticus listed the eight evil thoughts, gluttony, lust, avarice, anger, sloth, sadness, vainglory and pride. But it had Greek and Roman precedents, specifically the ethics of Aristotle. In the 6th century, Pope Gregory I revised Evacuous' list and turned it into the list of sins we know. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath and sloth. This video series explores the seven deadly sins as a Christian concept and beyond. What's so bad about these sins? How do they apply to present day life and society? And how can they influence our well-being and the well-being of those around us? And can non-Christians benefit from this concept? This essay delves into the mother of all sin, pride. When prideful, we take satisfaction in a supposed elevated and preferable position compared to others. We feel better than others, as individuals or as groups, because of specific characteristics and accomplishments. We might feel this way because of the ethnic group we belong to, the country we're born in, or even the gender we identify with. On the surface, pride doesn't seem so bad, but many Christians believe pride is very dangerous and a pathway to evil. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, says the Bible. Let's first briefly explore some Christian views and examples of pride. As we've seen in the story of Lucifer, pride leads to one's downfall, according to Christianity. The central idea behind the danger of pride seems to be that we are not greater than God. And as soon as we try to be above him, we get in trouble. An example of this we also see in the story of Adam and Eve, in which the same fallen angel, Lucifer, now the fully fledged Satan, disguised as a snake, convinced Eve that she could be like God if she ate the forbidden fruit. One interpretation of this story is that Satan tempted Eve by evoking her sense of pride through the disobedience of God. She assumed that she knew better than him and was supposed to be like him instead of serving him. From a Christian point of view, when we're prideful, we believe we're self-sufficient, as in, we don't need God and can live without Him. We think our accomplishments are our own doing. Well, they're actually the work of God. Like the proud Pharaoh of Egypt, who refused to set the Israelites free as ordered by God, saying, Who is the Lord, that I should obey His voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. End quote. 
Eventually, by sending 10 disastrous plagues to Egypt, God eradicated the Pharaoh's pride, so he realized he wasn't as powerful as he thought. Again, Pharaoh thought he was better than he truly was, above God in a way, and he and the people of Egypt paid a heavy price for it. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. End quote. Christian scholars have a consensus that pride is the worst of all sins, because, aside from biblical examples, it generates every other sin as a gateway drug that leads to other drugs. The reason why pride leads to other sins is because of the thought of being better than others. For example, pride leads to greed, because one feels entitled to have more, often at the expense of others. The lustful individual sees others merely as objects to be used because he believes he deserves it. Envious people feel like they should have what they want and can't stand others having what they think they should have but cannot. The glutton feels she deserves more food than necessary even when others are hungry and deprives them of it by taking it herself. In his arrogance, the wrathful person believes that he is always right and justly avenges what he sees as wrong by others. And lastly, the individual whose sin is sloth thinks she's too good to work and that others can do the work for her. Hence, in Christianity, pride is a sin and the worst of all sins. But what can we say about pride from a non-Christian viewpoint? If we don't take God into account, what then is wrong with pride? Pride, on the other hand, is the mother of all sins, and the original sin of Lucifer, an instrument, strung, but preferring to play itself because it thinks it knows the tune better than a musician." End quote. A proud person is full of himself. He rates himself exceptionally high compared to others. He, therefore, feels elevated above others, and other people's flaws confirm and strengthen his inflated self-image. Like C.S. Lewis' instrument, he thinks he knows better and is more capable than others, often even those who clearly have more expertise than him. Why would someone delude himself by thinking his expertise is superior when it isn't? Why, for the proud person, is the idea of being on top, the superior one, in whatever way, shape or form, more important than anything else? An article by John Amodeo, published in Psychology Today, explores the root of pride, saying, Pride is often driven by poor self-worth and shame. We feel so badly about ourselves that we compensate by feeling superior. We look for others' flaws as a way to conceal our own. We relish criticizing others as a defense against recognizing our own shortcomings. End quote. An excessively proud person feels inherently inferior. Otherwise, the need to be better than others wouldn't be so high on the agenda. The psychological condition, called narcissism, entails an extreme form of pride, deeply rooted in feelings of inferiority. A narcissist needs his pride, his sense of superiority, to maintain himself in the world, and without it, he would collapse under the weight of his self-perceived inadequacy. Unfortunately, the coping strategy of pride often turns out to be destructive. But pride is often subtle as well. For example, don't we love watching reality series, mainly to see how stupid the people in them are, compared to ourselves? Don't we enjoy gossiping about our neighbors and family members, just to feel better about ourselves? And how about cancelling other people who do or say things we disagree with? To what degree do we do this, to generally make the world a better place? And to what degree does cancel culture arise from pride? Even though pride may disguise itself as a force of good, it could actually make things worse. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited." End quote. Although it may seem harmless and preferable, pride and its consequences can be problematic. The story of the Greek mythological figure Narcissus shows an example of the harmful effects of pride. Narcissus admired himself so deeply that he fell in love with his reflection in a pool of water, on which he became so fixated that he couldn't look away anymore. He forgot to eat and drink, so his health and therefore his beauty declined until he died. There are many interpretations of so many different versions of the story of Narcissus. But at its core, it shows us how self-obsession leads to ruin. 
Also, it estranges us from the outside world. We can see this played out today. Many are more focused on their social media image than actually experiencing life, achieving something significant and maintaining meaningful connections with others. For example, many were in love with Narcissus, but he was incapable and unwilling to feel love toward a person. He could only love himself. His pride separated him from the world in a way prideful people separate themselves from others. Amadeo stated, Such overconfidence and arrogance push us away. Instead of relating to us as equals, they display an obnoxious superiority that makes us feel small. They have the knack of making us feel the shame that they refuse to face within themselves. End quote. Thus, the story of Narcissus shows that pride can work divisively, which we can also see with national pride, which divides groups of people. Sometimes such divisions are innocent, for example, aside from some exceptions, during a World Cup or the Olympics. National pride can be a source of social cohesion and solidarity, predominantly among those that belong to the group. But it can also be a source of hostility against the outgroup. We can see this with ultranationalist hate towards minorities. And probably the most famous example in history is National Socialism in Germany before and during the Second World War, based not only on national pride, but also on the pride of one's ethnicity. Similarly, some religious people are hostile toward outsiders. That hostility is evoked by pride. The idea that their religion is better than other religions, and that this makes them better people than those with a different religion. Within religions, pride also creates divisions between groups or individual practitioners. This spiritual pride revolves around the idea that one is a better practitioner than another. For example, a Muslim prays more often and thus feels she is a better Muslim than her neighbor. Or a Buddhist monk meditates more than his fellow monks and thus feels more advanced in the Buddhist path. Or regarding the sin of pride, a Christian behaves more humbly than their neighbor and thus feels she is better than him which in itself isn't very humble. Instead of accepting others, prideful people place themselves above others, which may eventually evoke hostility on both sides. Like Narcissus, the prideful person closes himself off from the world, absorbed with his superiority. Author and expert on Tibetan Buddhism, Alan Wallace, wrote, Tibetans look at a person who holds himself above others, believing he is better than others and knows more, and they say that person is like someone sitting on a mountaintop. It is cold there, it is hard, and nothing will grow. But if the person puts himself in a lower position, then that person is like a fertile field. For many, being proud of one's country is seen as a positive characteristic, including camaraderie, solidarity and loyalty. Especially at major sports events, national pride is prevalent and grows exponentially when one's national team wins. We won, we are the best, they say. But what exactly are they proud of and how much of it was their own doing? Things like nationality and bodily features like skin color or height. To what degree were these given to us by fate? And to what degree have they been our own doing? Most likely, we didn't establish these features ourselves. They are products of forces not in our control. Before birth, a baby doesn't pick the country he wants to be born in, nor does he choose his skin color, or whether or not he is tall or short. Yet, for some reason, people tend to derive pride from these characteristics, as if they are of their own making. They feel elevated above others, based on what's not their own doing. Not that it's wrong to be happy with specific preferable attributes, but is there any reason to be proud? In a short essay about pride, German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer wrote that pride isn't bad per se, but when it's unfounded, it's cheap. Rejecting pride, he argued, is done by those who haven't got much to be proud of themselves. He also noticed that people with no significant achievements resort to forms of pride like national pride as compensation. I quote, The cheapest sort of pride is national pride. For if a man is proud of his own nation, it argues that he has no qualities of his own of which he can be proud. Otherwise, he would not have recourse to those which he shares with so many millions of his fellow men. 
the man who is endowed with important personal qualities will be only too ready to see clearly in what respects his own nation falls short, since their failings will be constantly before his eyes. But every miserable fool who has nothing at all of which he can be proud adopts, as a last resource, pride in the nation to which he belongs. He is ready and glad to defend all its fault and follies tooth and nail, thus reimbursing himself for his own inferiority. End quote. Being proud of achievements that are not our own is delusional, which is quite apparent. But how much of our accomplishments, things we've worked hard for, like obtaining a PhD or building a successful business, is genuinely our own? A Christian might say, even though we worked hard for what we've accomplished, most of it is God's work. And thus, our pride isn't just, as we're prideful of things that ultimately aren't our own doing, or at least not as much as we would think. But if we would take God out of the equation, does this reasoning still stand? Take for example, someone who became a professor of philosophy. This individual had to study, be accepted into a PhD program, finish it, do a postdoc program, teach classes, publish articles, and more. Even Schopenhauer would say that after these many years of toil, the professor of philosophy deserved to be proud. His pride is fair. He might even boast about his accomplishments, saying, I did it all myself. I've come so far because of my hard work and dedication. But to what extent is such pride justified? For example, who paid for his education? Who helped him get accepted into university? Even if most of these events were due to his intelligence and hard work, who gave him his above average intelligence? Who gave him the right circumstances, like growing up in the right country, having a family with enough resources at their disposal? having the upbringing that stimulated and encouraged him to study, or in short, an environment that facilitated his path to becoming a professor. Was the whole foundation on which his success was built his own doing? What if he had been born a poor person in a third world country? Would his intelligence and hard work have gotten him so far? Our accomplishments, regardless of how hard we worked for them, have been largely built on luck. We could say that even without the Christian concept of God, it's reasonable to argue that we generally take too much pride in our accomplishments, as our roles in them are much smaller than we tend to think. For an atheist, it may not have been the Lord who created the circumstances and characteristics that made his path to success possible. Still, it's undeniable that fate played a significant role in it, and so taking all the credit for one's achievements isn't fair. Taking pride in things that are not our own doing is, again, delusional. Yet, we often exaggerate our roles regarding our achievements. Moreover, because of their accomplishments, people tend to feel superior to others, and even resort to calling people with fewer to no significant achievements, in their eyes at least, losers. But how is it justified to feel better than someone else, when, in all likelihood, the sum of circumstances was less favorable for that person? The Bible states, Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Is pride indeed the worst of sins, and a gateway to many evils, better to be avoided at all costs? Or is the Christian position towards pride too one-sided, meaning that pride also contains positive elements? We don't always perceive pride as an evil characteristic. In some instances, pride is a positive concept, if we see it as a positive emotional reaction to one's success, or a sense of satisfaction with one's circumstances. But if we see pride as arrogance, conceit, and a sense of superiority, it's a negative concept. In 2007, researchers Tracy and Robbins published a study named The Psychological Structure of Pride, a Tale of Two Facets. They proposed a dichotomy of pride consisting of authentic and hubristic pride. The term hubristic stems from the ancient Greek word hubris, which translates as excessive pride or self-confidence. The study argued that authentic pride is linked to achievement, accomplishment, confidence, productivity, and self-worth. Hubristic pride is linked to dominance and social validation, which motivates the pursuit of extrinsic goals, as this may lead to obtaining other people's acknowledgement, but also to aggressive behavior. 
the authentic and hubristic dichotomy shows similarities with Schopenhauer's distinction between pride and vanity, saying, and I quote, Pride works from within. It is the direct appreciation of oneself. Vanity is the desire to arrive at this appreciation indirectly, from without. End quote. Looking at the angel Lucifer, we could say that he tended more toward hubristic pride, as his pride and feelings of superiority were excessive, and he desired admiration from others by creating a throne above the stars and waging war to establish his dominance. Nevertheless, pride remains a complicated emotion. For some, it's the root of all evil. For others, it's not all bad. For example, to take pride in one's accomplishments. Others would say that most people exaggerate their roles regarding their accomplishments, which mostly result from external circumstances. God, from a Christian viewpoint. And because of that, pride isn't justified. John Amodeo argues that pride isn't a healthy form of self-worth, because if we base value on achievements or self-image, it's based on a fragile foundation. Instead, we could replace pride with dignity. I quote, a more genuine and stable self-worth is based upon validating, affirming and valuing ourselves as we are. Self-worth is a function of living with dignity, which exists apart from any accomplishments. Achievements are ephemeral and can become a trap. If too much of our attention goes toward accomplishing bigger and better things in order to feel good, then we become addicted to external sources of gratification." End quote. Is pride all bad or are there good sides to pride? Please leave your comments below. Thank you for watching.